think it all depends on your product. If your product is good, your food's going to come out better. If you have a good fig jam or you have a good harissa paste, it's going to be better than, you know, if you're buying something cheaper or something that's generic. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hazel. Today on the show, Matt is catching up with Eddie Massey, the chef and owner behind the extremely cool grocery store and deli, Eddie's Grocer, which has become one of the most talked about food businesses in Brooklyn. What did you guys talk about? And a few months ago, I found myself in Greenpoint and I'm, I'm walking down the street and then, oh my gosh, there's Eddie's Grocer. I read about this. I walk in and instantly I text you. I remember that. You were like, we got to have Eddie on the podcast. And here he is. The reason is, is this place is remarkable. It sells meze, which are the Lebanese small plates like baba ganoush, rosy ricotta, and za'atar goat cheese. He also has harissa paste, jams and oils, and all these packaged spice rubs. It's such a delightful shop, and he's got such an eye for detail. And he has some cookbooks behind the counter too, right? Absolutely. I, I look up and I see this large stack of cookbooks, and I'm, it's clear that he is a big cookbook collector and a cookbook head. And we talk about many of the titles in this podcast. And we also talk about the most surprising way that customers can help support a small business like his. He reveals this. It's, it was really eye-opening to me. Here's Matt catching up with Eddie. Eddie Massey, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to talk to you first about your catering career because that's where you got your start as a caterer. Yes. And we are in October right now and catering is back, it feels like. Tell me about some of the gigs that you picked up. I mean, it's been back, but I feel like it's back more than ever. Yeah. And we're also having lots of shortages everywhere oh, with everything. I mean, with labor, with food, and with disposables. So I think this time around, there's like an extra layer to everything. Um, but no, catering's been back. This week has been pretty busy already. I did like a few breakfast and lunch caterings in yeah. person up your Upper West Side. And I did a cocktail party the other day as well on Tuesday night. I mean, it's it's definitely back. And you've worked, you've had high profile fashion clients. And, and I wanted to bring up catering first because catering is where you seem to have gotten your start, yes. which then kind of segued into Eddie's Grocer, which I feel has been one of the buzziest um, food openings in the past couple years. So that that means so much to me. That really means so much. I mean, the way it all like happened is crazy. But like the transition from catering to that is what's crazy to me, like the craziest part of it, because it is so different. Like catering Mm -hmm. is so specific to one client. And having a store is specific of what it is but it's not specific to one client it's so many clients coming in so it's trying to like keep up with what people want and what they're looking for and what they like on this day and what they don't like on that day so tell me about the grocery because i feel like when you walk in i said aloud to myself when i when i walk into your green point it used to be a bodega we can get into the history of that i was like holy shit this takes so much work it i mean i respect it so tell me when you're walking into the grocery what am i seeing when I walk in. I mean, it's honestly so much work. It's a labor of love for sure. It's a very small store, but it's packed with so much. Um, So right when you walk in, you have the meze fridge, which has all our prepared dips. They're all prepared in home, packaged in home. The stickers are printed in home and they're stuck on them in home. And, you know, everything about the the meze fridge is what takes the most amount of labor, but it is our biggest seller, is what we're known for. Um, And then we have some salads and overnight oats and, you know, different types of to go things there as well and then you have lots and lots of imported goods from the Middle East like harissa paste Mm -hmm. and uh, jams and oils and all sorts of different things and then we have our own packaged spices dried goods dried fruits and um, yeah it's it's a non-stop machine for sure and then we have our breakfast menu a lunch (laughs) menu and like our platters of food so there's all sorts of different things it's amazing to to walk in because it's it's extremely curated when you talk about the 
products, it's it's like every product. There's small producers. There's producers from Lebanon. There's producers from America. And I just when I talk about work, it is the meze, but it's also just the the eye you have for product. I guess to me, this feels like such a modern day grocery store. Very curated. Very very special. How do you look at like, curating your products? How do you do that? Um, I really went back to what I used to purchase. Interesting. Like where I used to go to like different places to buy different things and I wanted to bring them into one store to to curate it to be Middle Eastern. Because I was doing a lot of Midi- Middle Eastern cooking, I had to go all over the city to buy my products. So I kind of wanted to bring them all into one home. Yeah. And also like... It, I think it all depends on your product. If your product is good, your food's going to come out better. If you have a good fig jam or you have a good harissa paste, it's going to be better than, you know, if you're buying something cheaper Mm -hmm. or something that's generic. Absolutely. And and back to the meze, I feel, and and please correct me if if, if this is off base, but you're kind of redefining what a meze can be because I feel like you've got hummus with duca and you've got grape leaves, but then you've got like twists that like rosy ricotta, ricotta. Like, do you feel like are you are you redefining what a meze can be? I I think I I think meze in Lebanon is a very wide like table of food. Like when you sit down at a restaurant, you get so many different mezes that are put down, like tapas, and it could be really anything. But yeah. here, I think people think of meze as like only hummus and baba ganoush and muhamra, but it's so much bigger and wider than that. And I think I've also transitioned like a lot of cheeses into meze yeah. and different sides into meze as well. I really like the way you put it because you're, you're clearly, this is how in Lebanon, this is the meze table. This is yes. you're a bit of a traditional. Yes. So I was I was off base and I like that you've kind of corrected it because it, this is what you will find a lot of these dishes in Lebanon. Uh, and, and tell me, when you're thinking about your customer, are they familiar with your, with Lebanese cuisine or is this like a new new step for a lot of them? I think this is very much a new step for a lot of them. A lot of people come in, they're like, what is this? What is yeah. that? What's in this? What's in that? And we're happy to explain it. I mean, that's why I am doing this is to spread the love of Middle Eastern food and Lebanese food and to spread awareness. Like, I love that people now know what Zat our paces and coming mm-hmm. in just to buy Zatar Pace or refilling it, I think that's huge to me. Um, and I think one of the best parts is doing this refill club is when people come back and they want more of a spice or more of the olive oil. It's like they're getting closer to this region of food and spices. Uh, like you, you bring up refill club and you, you're a marketer. You know yes. how to market your products and yes. your logo and you've got a wonderful team there. Talk about what Refill Club is. And I just, I I really wanted to talk to you because this is the redefinition of what a local grocery store can be like. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing is like, we're very community based. And what I wanted to do was kind of take what Sahadi builds a community around it and on Atlantic Avenue. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. love going, I used to love going there and to buy my bulk, you know, cashews and pine nuts and all that stuff. And I love mm-hmm. the refill there. Well, I mean, it's not refill, the filling in yeah. front of you. That's what I loved. Yeah. But I always wanted it to be more than that I wanted to come back and be able to like refill something instead of coming home and then putting it in my court container I wanted to bring it there so that was when I opened the store I wanted to do that with jars where you pick Mm -hmm. them and then you fill your own jars like kind of like the whole foods wall basically of dried goods but then I didn't do that because of COVID and people weren't you couldn't have scoops out you couldn't really do all that and so people couldn't fill their own things so then I was like well we're going to fill them and so we started with that and I started with a very low budget so we started with like I was doing core containers like I used to do and then we switched to these nice containers and we made it into a refill club and the whole idea of the refill club is for you to bring it back to the store so we refill it for you and so you're wasting less containers, but it's also like if you're using Zatar regularly, it's a great thing. Like the Olive Oil Club has been our biggest um, successes because people come in and they refill their olive oil. Yeah. And I think it really, that consistency of good olive oil makes a difference in your food. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to get about a hit on Zatar. Um, how do you think about Zatar and cooking with Zatar? Do you cook with it? Do you as use it as a spice addition? What's your best way of describing it? So I, I mean, I, I could write a whole cookbook on different ways to use zatar, but sure. I do, I do like, 
I do cook with it, I think, a lot more than just topping things with it. I think there's specific places to use that. I also think when you cook za'atar, it, the flavor changes a lot, it a lot. Yeah, so like za'atar paste, when you're cooking it, changes a lot than like raw za'atar paste. So I think there's different ways to use it. Like at the store right now, like, you know, there's of course the manouche with the za'atar paste on top that goes in the oven and gets cooked, but then we put za'atar paste on top of our labneh toast, and there's just a different level of acidity and herbiness oh, right. there. And because when sumac gets cooked, Cooked, it just develops a bit more. Yeah. Um, and I recently did this little video that I'm going to be coming out with soon. And we're like, I made like Zatar three ways where we did a Zatar chicken, a Zatar egg, yeah. and then we made the manouche and the Zatar paste and just seeing different ways to do it. So when you're marinating something with it, like a Zatar chicken, you're mar- marinating it overnight with lemon juice and garlic and it's getting absorbed into the chicken. So when you're cooking it, the flavor's Deep, deep within. Yeah. And then when you're making a za'atar egg, we do, I do like a shakshuka, but instead of the tomato paste I use, tomato sauce I use za'atar paste. Mm-hmm. And it cooks the egg so perfectly because it's like you're frying them in the za'atar paste. And the za'atar paste becomes crunchy. It's like so many different textures you can go with it. Yeah, I think it's one of the most dynamic spice blends or, or spices, depending on how you define it, um, around. I mean, it's, yeah. and anyone who's who roasted chicken with it knows that it takes it to just a different dimension. And I love that you, you should write that book. Like, let's... let's <laughs> <laughs> sign you up. And speaking of books, also yes. when I walked in, I, I, I swung a left and I looked at your cold counter and then I see this long stack of cookbooks. And, you know, I love and I think many of our listeners will agree when you walk into a restaurant or a bar or a shop and you see a, a well-worn collection of cookbooks, there's a, just something about that, that there's a trust. You know that the owner is actually caring about what you're producing. So let's hear a little bit about the books that you have back there. Well, first off, I love cookbooks. I have always loved cookbooks. I've always collected them. Like from middle school and high school, I still have a box of cookbooks in my mom's basement, my parents' basement. So I've always loved cookbooks. And I think it ties a room together, like you said. It just brings something to a room. And the books that we have back there, I mean, I have some of my favorites, but I also have some just ones that color coded in, you know, sure. and I have some great ones at home as well. But I, you know, I love anything that Salma Hajj does. She's done mm-hmm. so many great Lebanese cookbooks now, mm-hmm. like so proud of that. And I think those are amazing. Uh, Bethany has done the Jewel Table. Mm-hmm. I love the Jewel Table. I think it's a very great modern yeah. twist on a Lebanese cookbook. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely amazing. Also, anything Otolenghi, I will eat up, I will (laughs) drink up, I will cook up. (laughs) It's just, he's, I think, one of the best, um, especially with simple like Middle Eastern cooking. Oh, his rice, the way he cooks rice is just I mean, tremendous. It's just everything. And, yeah. you know, he came out with a master class too that I was all over. I mean, yeah. I love anything he does. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So you will you would see a lot of his cookbooks around yeah. too. And maybe sometimes I take them out off to like use them for like, sure. you know, ideas and then they come right back up there. Yeah, I love that. And it's clear that you you really pour through them with, with what you're selling, what you're mm-hmm. cooking at, mm-hmm. your, at, your, at your shop. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about your pop-ups because – it's been part of the ethic of Eddie's Grocer. It has been the pop-ups, the collaborations yes. with others. So talk about how you think about the working with other um, cultures, other creators, and how do you merge together your your worldviews in these pop-ups? So when I first moved to New York City, I met I, I moved in with Lei Ti Su. She's a Taiwanese um, cook. She used to have her own podcast, Word of Mouth, and she introduced me to a whole world of food and I started doing pop-ups with her. And that's how I started doing pop-ups was long time, like six, seven years ago now. And we would do these Taiwanese Lebanese pop-ups. And I just thought, you know, New York is such a melting pot and it's so cool to see so many different cultures in one place. Why not see different cultures on one table or on one dish? And that is huge to me. I think the world is all about migrating different things. I think like Middle Eastern food and Mexican food is so similar, Mm -hmm. but we don't really define it as that, but it's so, so similar. So I think it's cool to do these collab, and I think it's a great way to invite people into your kitchen and into your space, where you're bringing both your expertise, instead Mm -hmm. of like, because you know, chefs are very one-headed. They like it their way. (laughs) So (laughs) if, if you bring a chef in and you're like, okay, give me what you do, and I'll give you what I do, and let's make something together I feel like there's something about that that doesn't make it like 
one headed or you know yeah. cocky chef moves you know it's it's uh, very much a collab it becomes one kitchen instead of a uh, chef coming into your kitchen love that yeah now you talk about mexican and lebanese crossover i'm just mm. curious um are there literal crossovers between lebanon and mexico like in terms of cuisine yeah i mean if you think of i mean the tacos like taco rabbit or just tacos in general it's it's a shawarma um, exactly so it's literally the same thing and i think there there is some history that i think david chang talked about that in one of his taco episodes um out in california yeah so i uh, there is definitely a cross there so t- and I, d- I didn't want to leave the witness of the question because i wanted to get exactly yes. your in your words and not because yeah, i yeah. think that's great no I mean, so i do think there there's so much i think there's so much i mean i'm not sure if there really is but i do think there is so much absolutely and and I feel like the with James Park, James yes. E, you collaborated with in a Korean a Lebanese pop up, and yes. talk about that one a little bit. It's cool. Oh, that's so fun because James and I go back a few years and yeah. we work together, so it's really like beautiful to make something together and. I taught him a lot about Lebanese food when we worked together, and he taught me so much about Korean food mm-hmm. that I like really fell in love with Korean food. So it was really cool to collaborate and bring our flavors together. Mm-hmm. And I think you know we you always make it work. And I think it's so cool to be able to combine Korean and Lebanese because they are really so different, so so oh, yeah. different. Yeah, and 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 tell me, uh, is there a dream collaboration? Oh, there's so many. Reach out to somebody here at Taste Listener, Mike. (laughs) Uh, There's so many. Um, I would say (laughs) Oprah. I would love to collab with her farms because she's got so many great produce, like a Malibu in Hawaii, like, you know, cooking up some of that stuff. I know she's not the one cooking, but it would be amazing. Um, I would also say, even though they're similar in a way, I would love to collab with Andy Bergani. I think it Mm -hmm. would be, like, really, really fun. Um, And... I respect him so much, yeah. and I think his food is absolutely beautiful. So to be able to do like a Persian Lebanese, I think that would be really fun. His book looks really cool. It's coming out next year. And I know. I can't wait. I can't I wait. I cannot well. wait. Yeah. I feel like the Andy Eddie's uh, grocer uh, collab can happen. Yeah. I feel like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Something's probably in the works. Okay. <laughs> um, but let's talk about the future of what you're doing in Greenpoint because you have. Uh, well, first off, let's talk about how you established. Eddie's Grocer, you took it over from an old, older uh, Polish woman. Is that yes, correct? That you had, correct. You've been you've been visiting the uh, her bodega f- as a customer for years, and you decided to take it over. Talk a little bit about that history, and then we can get into the future. Yeah, of course. So. I mean, I think our story is like, you know, I believe in everything happens for a reason. And our story is really crazy. You know, she moved here from Poland when she was 10. I moved here from Lebanon when I was 10. She took over the deli when she was 24. I took over the deli when I was 25. So like, and we're both Sagittarius's. So I just, I find that so funny in a Mm way. Um, And I think it's really beautiful that it's one generation of immigrants to the next generation of immigrants. And I, and that's why there's so much like love and core in that store. Like just when you walk in, I mean, she worked in there for 43 years. That is a lifetime. And it's just, there's so much love there, you know, already. So I used to live around the corner. That's where I ran my catering business. Mm -hmm. Um, And I used to come in all the time. I used to come fill my like canisters of coffee from her and like would get my lunches from there, get lunches from my staff when we're driving out to the Hamptons from there. I mean, I, I loved going to Maria's Deli. She made the best turkey sandwiches and chicken cutlet sandwiches. That's the best. Unexpected uh, dish. I was thinking something more stuffed, but like a tur- what makes this turkey sandwich special I want to know it's because she's first of all she makes them and she slices the lettuce the tomato and the pickles yes. on the slicer and I think something about that layers it yeah. so well and it's not like juicy tomatoes that have been chopped ahead mm-hmm. and um, her bread was very good yeah. get it toasted and then on Friday she did a fried chicken sandwich uh, not chicken fried fish sandwich mm. not chicken fish it was so good and it had like a little polish twist to it and it was just so good i mean yeah i love i love the the story and i can't wait to hear more about i feel like you're gonna write about your collaboration with her at some point or your 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 relation with her it's it's a great story so five years from now where will you be what is eddie's grocery gonna be (laughs) i I know this is like a one of those (laughs) questions sigh let's take a pause (laughs) (sighs) okay (sighs) yeah it's it's hard to say. Um, I hope the catering grows. I hope that I can keep spreading, you know, Lebanese food and Lebanese cooking and 
the love of Lebanese spices and all that. Um, I really, will there be a second location? I don't know. Mm. Will we, uh, I, I just, I don't know which path to take, you know? I would love to start co-packing and start mm-hmm. selling our meze dips to different stores. That I would love. But the idea of that scares me in a way because of the logistics that goes into yeah. it. And just owning a business in New York is so hard yeah, that it really is day by day, especially with our like economy and life right now. I tell you, it's a struggle day to day to get through like owning a business. So it's been, I used to have five year goals and I think it's been so hard in the past year that I have kind of shut down on those ideas. And I'm like, let me focus on now because I have no idea where we're going. I really respect that you've been candid here because it is, um, you could talk to big game, like we're going to scale, we're going to do co-packing, but like your honesty is, is touching to me. And I'd like to know, and for our listeners, this might be a good thing to hear from you. What can we as customers do for small businesses in uh, neighborhoods in New York and Chicago and L.A. or even in smaller towns? What can we do as customers to really help you survive? I mean, there's obviously paying you money for goods frequently is one thing. But is there anything else that we're maybe forgetting? Um, I think one of the biggest things is um, coming out on a rainy day. Yeah. Weather really affects small businesses, and it's something that we don't really talk about. Oh. But when it rains, that means I'm not breaking even that day. That means we're losing money today because it's raining. And having because we're not on a delivery platform because we can't keep up with that, um, it's very hard. And mm-hmm. so I think on a rainy day, going out and supporting your local business, that's the best thing that you can really do. And always word of mouth always like if you like a small business spread it spread the joy of it whether it is on social media on your story which takes Mm -hmm. two seconds or just next time you're out you tell people when you walk by you tell your friend that's visiting hey love this place I think just that awareness that is that marketing and that itself Mm -hmm. is is how how you can help a small business that's really smart way to articulate the, the the support that we can provide as customers mm-hmm. and I, I don't think about weather myself so that's that's something that's new to me and um, if you did co-pack and you decided to start selling your products what would you want to sell like wh- where what do you what what was the product what is your meze what would break out I think the marinated feta yeah um nice. I would say which is like not really Lebanese but yeah. It's just my twist on it. Or yeah. I would say the Shankleesh, because a lot of people don't know what Shankleesh is. Um, Lebanese, of course. We love Lebanese. Um, spicy tomato jam. Mm-hmm. What's Shankleesh? What is it? Shankleesh is a aged, like, Lebanese ball um, that has, like, ash on the outside. It's yeah. been smoked and aged. So normally in Lebanon, what you would do is you crumble it up and you have it with diced tomatoes mm-hmm. and diced fresh onions. And you mix it with olive oil and a little bit of herb. So what we've done to it to preserve it is crumble it up and add some spicy tomato jam to it and caramelized onion for about an hour mm-hmm. and add it to it. And it's like a caramelized onion, spicy tomato jam, cheesy goodness. You add the cheese element. Yes. Holy cow. And it's just so Off good. Off to the races. Yeah. Really, I, I mean, I hope I see this one day in, in like, you know, ShopRite. That would be really fun. I would love that. We ask every guest on the Taste Podcast, if you could write a cookbook without time or budget being a factor, what would it be? Um, <laughs> so many ideas. Um, I think something that I really want to do later on in my life is go back to Lebanon for three months, travel around the country, talk to some grandmas, learn Mm -hmm. some good recipes. You know, my grandma taught me everything that has to do with cooking and Lebanese food. And I think there's no one better to learn it from than the older generation. And there's a lot of stories to be told that are not told from small villages. I think going around and learning from them because I never got to write my grandmother's recipes down. So I'd love to go and write other grandmother's recipes down and learn it from them and make it possible or doable in America in a way. I love that. I feel like it. Yeah. you have the art of, of storytelling and, and visuals. You really have that gift to, to express that way. So I, I hope, I hope we can see that cookbook happen. Thank you. Eddie Massey, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Of course. Thank you for having me. 
The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.